Welcome to the Propulsion Swimming Podcast, where we aim to give swimming the coverage and publicity it deserves. Every week, we celebrate the sport we love with amazing special guests and topics from around the swimming pool. And now, here are your hosts, Scott and Dan. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast. I'm your host, Scott, and back with me this week is Dan, and we have another very special guest with us. Joining us on this week's podcast is Jamie Main, head coach of DaVencio XL over in Sheffield. How are you doing, Jamie? Welcome to the podcast. I'm good. I'm going to correct you. We're in Derby. Derby. Okay. Yeah, we're based in Derby. Yeah, yeah. Not far from Sheffield, but I did see that, and I was like, ah. Oh. We have trained at Sheffield a couple of times, but uh, I think it's because both me and Dan have competed at the Davencio XL Level One meet, which is yeah, at yeah. Ponds which Forge Ponds every Forge. year. Yeah, we have yeah. those. We have our meets at Ponds, so uh, it's the closest fifty meter pool with a swim down. So that's why yeah. we go up there. And and it's sort of Derbyshire is quite a long county, so mm-hmm. we we do have members from further north in the county, which is they're literally like fifteen minutes from Ponds Forge. So we we have had stuff training wise up there but uh yeah predominantly based derby. Around, around derby yeah so how does defensio xl kind of work as a club because i know it's quite a it's a big is it an umbrella club for the whole kind of county yeah so it, it was it was based on the nova model um hmm. so I, just a bit of background so the uh i i, I grew up in nottingham i still live in nottingham which is which is literally 15 miles down the road from derby um Great city. Yeah, swam. I went swam. to uni there. Did you? Oh, yeah. yeah uh, he was it. always going to bring that up, wasn't he? You always. Yeah, yeah. I love yeah. that. <laughs> it's a great place. <laughs> uh, it's, it is a great city. Yeah, and that's why I, I haven't moved too far, really. Um, uh, so I, I grew up in a, a home club at Bramcott and then moved quite quickly to, to Nova as, as m- the county squad um, and ended up on the top group with Bill furnace and swam there till I was about 17 and then um, I went back and volunteer coached at my home club Bill found out that I was doing a bit of coaching and invited me to come and help at Nova mm-hmm. and then that it was a bit strange because I was coaching guys um, on the top group when I was helping out I was coaching guys I swam with which was which was which was interesting but they did give me a lot of time and respect mm. and um so I, I was working with like Olympians and international guys from day one. And that was, I was only 20 at the time. Um, and Straight in the deep end. Yeah, mm-hmm. no, but it, it was great. It was a great sort of apprenticeship. And um, I coached under Bill for, until he, he retired from Nova uh, after London. So 12 years, just over, he helped out for a year until he got the head coach job at British Swimming. So he was still yep. coming in five, six times a week. Um, and that was a nice transition over. And I uh, had coached that for two years. And then um, I decided to have a little career break uh, just just for personal reasons. Um, and then DX came hunting because I was keen to get back in after my year break and been there for, this is my sixth season at DX. But the, the two models are quite closely related, both county squad setups. So there's a lot of smaller clubs, um, not in terms of membership because of some decent sized clubs, but in terms of water time mm-hmm. uh, and space. So the coach ratios are a lot better at Nova and DX compared to sort of home clubs, feeder clubs. Um, and it is, it's like the, the, the sort of pinnacle of that pathway triangle, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, so it was quite familiar to me, the setup, obviously I've been at Nova for 14 years as a coach and, several years as a swimmer to, to to almost come straight in and and know what the setup was about and how yeah how the relationships worked within that setup uh, in terms of uh, working with home clubs and coaches and and feeding kids through at the right time um, to suit their development and making sure that we we do right by those those kids at the, at the sort of top end of those county pathways mm. So you're doing a great job at DaVencio and there's some incredible British talent coming from there. What is the secret to your success as a team? Uh, 
Thank you. Um, Big question. <laughs> Straight away. So, I mean, DX has always produced. So even going back to when it was first set up under Mark Rose, who's now at Manchester, mm. um, and then Andy Manley, who's now director of swimming at Loughborough. And yeah. um, they've always produced really good age group youth swimmers who have then gone on. Like you just have to look at the alumni who are now at the National Centre, people like Abby Wood, Sarah Vasey, Molly Renshaw. Mm. Um, it's just some, some real big hitters who, who have come through DX. So it was, a, it was already a successful programme. I think the things we've had to deal with in the last six years is, is, is more around sort of the adversity. So we, we've, we've lost our main pool. We've had to go out of county. We've had to... Um, sort of scrap around pool time, be really creative. And I would say that's born a sort of culture of togetherness, um, backs to the wall mentality. Um, and during that, that troubled time where we're having to travel a lot more to pools and um, a lot of sort of hurdles around sort of um, logistics, I, I guess. We, we didn't lose a member, which, which sort of says... Okay, we, that's good. We've that's got very it good right. Guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's a constant reinforcement of that. I like I'd, I'm a big believer in not only um, sort of my attitude um, being right and that reflected in, onto the swimmers, but also the leaders in the pool. So we have some really good sort of attitude and culture champions in the pool, in the training environment. And they're not like loud, but their actions are really, really positive uh, and performance orientated. So um you know the, their, their actions lead the way i would say people like jacob and mia um, mm. jacob whittle and mia slevin but also guys who, who who aren't at that international level have really good standards in what they do day to day yeah you finding kind of that important team morale and kind of culture is driving on the individual results as a swimmer are they are they celebrating the individual results as a team basically yeah yeah, yeah, they, they're, they're really good at that. Like the, the, the community, I always moan about their communication, but that's generally to me. Um, <laughs> that's teenagers, uh, isn't it? Yeah, it's teenagers. But their communication with each other is really strong and, and they're mm. good supporters, whether that's um, the, like the people we've t- spoken about on the international level or at recent trials we've just had uh, a couple of weeks ago. But yeah, uh, but, but even... Um, so the day-to-day communication and the uh, positive net, positive messages they, they give out amongst each other is a real, real good vibe there. Awesome. I mean, you must, you must be so proud of both Mia and Jacob. They're both some amazing at trials. Um, yeah. What were your thoughts on trials as a whole? Uh, I, th- I, th- I think, obviously, the, guy, the trials was aimed at people who, who had been part of the Elite Returns training yeah. set up. So um, Jacob, because he's on... A funded program for UK sport and British swimming. He, he got access um, halfway through the, the first lockdown. So he was back in with those funded guys at the national centers right from May. He hasn't had any interruptions. Uh, and that's, you could see that in the results. Mia, mm. diff, slightly different. She's on England performance program. Um, so she didn't get any access in the first lockdown. So she, she had to be okay. really, really, we had to be really, really creative in terms of, what could she gain out of that period? Um, mm. and, and that's probably a podcast in itself, just her <laughs> development over the last year. She was fortunate that they started to look at that in the second lockdown. So she got a bit of access at the back end of November and then through this, this um, recent lockdown period, she, she was able to access, but that was difficult because her uh, pool she could get in was in Northampton. And she lives okay. in Derby, which is now and a half away. Mm-hmm. So she was packing up her little VW up with a suitcase <laughs> full of dumbbells and pull-up bar, <laughs> uh, a mini fridge and a oh, suitcase wow. clothes. And she was staying in a hotel Monday night through to Saturday morning on her own at 17. She only passed wow. away for Christmas. So that just shows like the commitment that, yeah, I was gonna that say. our guys have got. Mm. Like she, She's done exceptionally well considering in, in the last year she missed four four and a half months worth of pool work um, was she kind of in the pool by herself down at Northampton or were you in constant communications with her yeah, or was it like, self-motivation 
uh, she's got she's gained a lot of self drive. Mm. Uh, first to admit that and gained a lot of independence in the last year. Um, but we'd be on FaceTime every day. I'd be mm. sending her sessions. We'd be debriefing those sessions when she get back to the hotel at night. What do we need to tweak? Um, and fortunately, after the second Manchester meet, the British Invitational, because things were getting a lot better in terms of COVID figures and there was deemed to be less, slightly less risk, I was able to go in a, a couple of times a week to work with her. And that was, okay. that was nice in the lead up to trials. So when you're in a taper, you, you sometimes have to make coaching decisions there and then, and that really mm. helped that process. Um, with Jacob, because he's been in the whole time, um, I was drafted into the centre in January to work with him and the other national centre swimmers, which was, which was great, um, which gave them a lot more attention um, leading up to trials. And, and, I, and I think that worked really well working with Mel, Mel Marshall. Mm-hmm. And um, as I say, really giving those guys a little bit more input, help their sort of journey through that period. Yeah, I guess that's one positive that's come from COVID is that these younger athletes who are right on the cusp of the elite level, they've now been almost forced into that really professional mindset if they've wanted to succeed in the sport. It's kind of, it's not weaned out the weak, but it's certainly set a really, really, really good foundation for these swimmers, especially looking forward to kind of Paris if we look past Tokyo, these the next generation of British swimmers could be the best yet, considering what they've had to go through. I agree. I agree. Although the you know, and don't get me wrong, they were extremely grateful they could get in. Whether it was Jacob in the first lockdown and the cohort he was in, mm. or Mia in back end of November, and there was another group that managed to get in early February, back end of January, the, the England Junior squad were, were getting in a little bit. Um, but they were so grateful for that opportunity. and um, But I agree, it's definitely made um, this generation a lot more resilient, a lot more um, appreciative of their sport because they've, they've had it taken away from them at various mm-hmm. degrees, but they've all lost yeah. something. Um, and, and I think the way they developed as people will, will set them up down the line, not, not only just in the sport, but in their yeah. life beyond the sport, I think. Yeah, I think the worry out of COVID is that suddenly will almost there be a massive dropout from swimming. But actually, it could very much be the opposite effect that these older swimmers have a bigger appreciation. Maybe they go on to masters, even if they don't get onto that elite level. They want to stay engaged in a sport because they've been forced to have time away from the pool. It's it's kind of it's going to be a really interesting next few years to see what happens with the sport. Yeah, I I agree. I'm I'm hopeful of that. Um, mm. In terms of people gaining that appreciation and continuing. I, I, I think that maybe we're going to lose some, some of the younger kids because they're, if they're, especially if they're multi-sport because they've been yeah. allowed to get back in uh, sports outdoors um, and, and swimming is obviously a little bit behind that, but, uh, but I do hope that we retain uh, some degree of uh, participation at, at club level and, and clubs yeah. survive because I, th- I still think there's some challenges ahead in terms of mm. how, how club setups are going to be funded, especially over the next 12 months. Um, mm, and, definitely. And, and it's important that we all try and work together to, to, to keep this, this, this going and come out of this strong as we can really. Well, there's been fantastic COVID measures at the both Manchester meets and, of course, trials as well. And we were talking about it with, especially with the women's hundred breaststroke, with Sarah Vasey and Imogen Clark having to stay in a hotel for pretty much four or five days before they get the chance to race. So I was going to quickly mention that actually Mia must have been half used to that, having that sort yeah. of situation mm. going. Yeah, she she did a, a remarkable job, and I'm you know I've got loads of stuff I can put into a presentation and around her development, as I say, but. Yeah, she she was fine in in those environments. She she you know found things to keep herself busy and <laughs> um, and, and Sarah because obviously I've been working with that group. She, she again Mel did a really good job with her of setting up things to to keep her occupied. Mm. Um, and she was really buoyant when she was coming down for her sessions at trials. Sarah was uh, really positive around everything she was doing and and um, and I, and again I, I think just an example of that 
being grateful that we had the opportunity to do a trials because mm. you know there's a lot a lot of work and a lot of credit needs to go to british trimming just to be able to get mm. those trials on yeah, yeah. Um, you know and, and it, it was different to manchester because you're dealing with local councils so manchester you know that the, they had slightly different views on on protocols to london um and london where it where the position of the pool is it's obviously connected to pretty much the, the stratford westfield which is mm. extremely busy so there's considerations around crowds of people and all, all sorts of things on top of manchester and, and, a, and a different level of of risk i guess uh, mm. but I, but i think british women a lot of credit has to go to the leadership group you know chris spice and uh, Tim Jones and, and Matt Ashman, who heads up the, the sort of medicine, uh, sports science side of things to make sure that it was a safe, safely run trials. Mm. Yeah, it was really good to see kind of, especially some of the times coming out of trials. It was crazy. I don't, I don't think any of us expected to see such fast times all around the park, considering the disruption that swimming's had. If, yeah. we, if we kind of touch on Jacob Whittle's performances a little bit, because there were some outstanding swims across the park. And I think myself and Dan, we thought they were coming from Manchester. Did I mean, even in the 50 freestyle, he dropped a 0. Point, what, by 0. 0.5, which is yeah, massive in a 53. Yeah. Did you guys as a team kind of expect such a good meet at just 16 years old? Um, I mean, I'd seen stuff in training, particularly mm. from, from, from New Year. Um, and, and we... I say we're really fortunate that we could access the national centre and work 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 in that environment. Um, and he he'd done things where I, I thought he'd go forty eight uh, mm. high. Um, it was just whether you know he could put himself in consideration for the summer and what that might look like. And and I'd, he'd done some some impressive stuff in training. And I, and I and I I thought he could. He could do that on the 100. The 50, like you said, is a little bit of a surprise. Mm. Um, the thing is with Jay, like he's he's a very uh, rangy swimmer. His distance per stroke is exceptional. Mm. And I think on the 50, sometimes he can he can wheel spin a little bit. Mm. And it's almost like he has to go at 95% and he swims quicker because he just holds yeah, the water yeah. so well. Um, Did so he go he, into that 50 with a little bit less pressure on his shoulders then maybe? Yeah, I think so. And and we just said, look, just find a rhythm, even mm. though it's it's 20 seconds. Like, he, you know, he, if he can find a rhythm and feel like he's gripping the water, he'll yeah. swim faster. And so he managed to do that. Um, and I, and then he backed it up in the final. It was a different different feel in the final because he was next to Ben, who, yeah. who was just mm. really so far ahead of everyone. And he got a little bit of wash, but he, he managed to do a very similar swim. So yeah, the fifty was a bonus. To be honest, like I, he just he just found that optimum stroke rate that enabled him to to keep hold of the water. The hundred, I thought he could do that. I think he surprised himself a little bit um, in terms of the outcome and the time. He uh, he got a little bit excited in the heats, um, <laughs> and got got into a dog fight. But when he swims it to his strengths, mm. he, he swims really fast because he just. He, he, he's so smooth down the first 50 naturally and then he turns mm. and comes back. It's a bit like a, a Kyle Chalmers type of feel to that 100 with him. Um, yeah, yeah, we've got a few kind of young freestylers who are almost copying the Aussie the Aussie 100 freestyle. I know Matt Richards is very much the same. The, the yeah, second Matt, 50 yeah. is looking really strong. Yeah, yeah, and I, I quite like swimming it like that. I mean, I, I coached a, a lady to the Beijing Games, Jess, Sylvester, um, she was in my sprint group at Nova back in the day, and, and she swam it the same way. It was quite mm. funny. Jess messaged me after the final and said, uh, "Jay seventh for the turn sounds familiar." So, <laughs> like, uh, that's the way. No uh, panic. No, no panic. Stay relaxed. Turn and go. And I think Jay swam it really, really well. And our aim was always to be the strongest in the in the last fifteen, and he was. And, and credit mm. to him, he stuck to his race plan and got his reward i was gonna say do you feel a little bit of pressure coaching jacob because as far as we know he's the fastest ever 16 year old over 100 meters is there sort of a bit of pressure or do you, do you feel excitement similar to like what we do 
No, I mean he's he is sixteen, but he's very down to earth guy. Like he's 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 quite uh, mature and grounded. Um, and I think at the end of the day, I, I, the way my philosophy is, like we, we're trying to add value to young people, and and if we do that and they swim fast, great. Um, I, I, I he doesn't feel the pressure, and I mm. and I certainly don't. We just do what we do, and 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 if we get some nice outcomes off the back of it. That, then fantastic and more importantly you know can, can we inspire some more young people to come through that's mm. that's the most important thing yeah no pressure it's just it's it's an enjoyment to watch him in that good yeah. yeah yeah and he's he does stuff day to day and you just you, you know you do stand back and go, that's, that's pretty impressive that um mm. <laughs> and, and he's, he's got some nice physical assets like he's, he's tall he's six five he's mm massive hands and feet um but but a real credit as well to like um the coaches that that he was with before he came into my group i mean mm. you know going back jack chambers who, who heads up our, our national sort of age to youth program did a fantastic job sort of ironing out the scrappiness i would say uh, and he's, mm. he's still working on that he's still working on that now and i don't think he ever stopped working on it's sort of technical aspects of the sport. And then back in his home club, uh, Glenn, Glenn Fisher was fantastic. And, and Glenn still has a big influence over him now. And, and they're more good friends now than anything. And a, a lot of credit needs to go to Glenn and Jack, I would say, for his early development. So when a swimmer of this kind of talent comes into DaVinci as a club, how much sort of transition period do you have between their former club and yourself and do they do they carry on training with their old club at the same time but you're giving them age group sets is that how it works so uh we've had a little bit of a transition as a program since jay came in um mm. he came he funny because he came into the x pretty much the same i came time i came in as a head coach so okay we've both both been with, within a few weeks of each other so he came in just before his 11th birthday uh uh, in the September and that's when I joined as head coach and he mm. was doing two sessions a week with us and then probably three with his home club and Glenn um, okay. and then that transitions over we had a part-time group then we don't have one currently mm. um, although we do transition kids gradually so they'll probably come in a few sessions and then it gradually moves over over a, mm. uh, a sort of two to four month period so they're coming in full time uh, Jay was in that part-time group probably for six months and then uh, we moved him in full-time and he was with Jack from uh, May time. Uh, that would be 2016. Um, he's with Jack for uh, two, I would say just over two years. So 2018, September, we started to transition him into my group. We did that twice a week. And then in the school holidays, October half term, he came in for the full week. And then after that, he was in four times a week. And then at Christmas, he moved up full time. So we transitioned him from the mm. age group program into the senior group. He was, he was fast enough in the summer. We just felt from a social, psychological um, and technical point of view, it was better for, to move him that way. Just because I felt like Jack hadn't quite ironed out a few things he was working on. Um, he was much younger than the cohort I had, so there needed to be a sort of bedding in period with that. Um, and we, we had some really good guys. Like we had Ryan Reader. I don't know if you know the Ryan. Like he was a uh, open water guy, national medalist, open water, very close to sort of GB selections. He was our captain then, and did a great job of putting his arm around Ryan when he first uh, round Jake when he first moved up. Um, and we went on a camp, I remember, to Dubai. And, and he was he was uh, finding his feet with lots of banter and things like that then. And then, <laughs> like, he went, what did he go in Dubai? 52-0. He was only 14 then. And then he went 50.4 at trials, 50.37, I think it was, and qualified for European Junior. So, it's not I, that I, bad. <laughs> yeah, he was only 14 then. And, and then obviously he was the first 14 year old to break 50. So he mm. went 49, nine at juniors and, uh, and then it's just developed since then, really. Um, it's interesting. Cause it almost, 
from someone who's never been in a setup where it's got that umbrella club, the um, the umbrella club to me actually sounds like a normal club. It doesn't sound kind of this elitist squad. It does sound like your traditional club feeding through. It, it's, like it's yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Well, I think that's the best way to look at it. And those models work well when it's almost like they they sit on sit at the, as a as a top couple of groups of a, yeah. of a club. and I think yeah. we have a very family orientated feel even though we're we're you know we've got some high performance guys in there um, and it is the top end of that uh, at the end of the day we're all just people and I think it, it's important that the kids and the coaches and the staff have good values and we try and mm. project that through and I, I, it's, it's definitely not elitist what, what people would perceive as elitist yeah i think it's it's the clubs that i know me and dan have been involved in it's almost i'm not sure i could see it happen because some of the coaches wouldn't like to share their swimmers and check their egos at the door if that makes sense they, they like that swimmer to be associated to their club and their one name it i don't know it's, it's refreshing to hear from someone who hasn't been in it actually yeah i mean it has its challenges i mean you you, you do come across those types of characters at times um, with, with, with some home home coaches mm. um, sort of hanging on to swimmers, I guess. But it's just about trying to build that trust with them. And, and we always try and recognise where the kids have come from. Um, you know, I've mentioned Glenn at, when he was at Ripley, um, looking after Jacob as a, a really young age grouper. And um, we, we try and do that with, with, with the successes that the swimmers uh, having at DX, we always try and recognise the journey they've been on to get there. Yeah, it's like when Abby Wood was on the the heat sheets at Manchester. It's not down as Loughborough or Deventure. It's down as Buxton, isn't it? It's Buxton, yeah, 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 connecting back to her kind of first time club stuff yeah, exactly, like that. Exactly, um, and and we. It, you, you know, all those kids, Abby was at Buxton, Molly Renshaw was Ripley, the same as Jacob. Mia mm. is, uh, Mia is at Wool, at Wool Eagles, a uh, small club in the, in the south of Derbyshire. So it's important that, that, that they're recognised for their work in, in, in the communities that they serve, definitely. Mm. It must be all to do with communication, really, because really we should all be targeting one thing about trying to get the summer to be at the best that they can be. Where and like Scott alluded to it, that the coach's ego, and I think there there are some coaches that just want to have a summer to swim for them, and it kind of makes them look good rather than trying to get the summer to be the best that he can be. So I I I, I appreciate that model. I actually really like it, and it's obviously working for Jacob. Definitely, um, communication is is key, and we all fall down on communication at times. I, I hold my hands up sometimes. You know, you, you're getting so distracted and in certain areas especially at busy times that the, the things do slip but I'm the first to hold my hands and say you know sorry about that we'll try and do better and mm. um you know I I try not to sort of sort of gloss over things when they're not so great I, I'll try and learn from it and do better next time and we, we say that to the swimmers um as well it's it's okay to make a mistake and fail as long as you learn um mm. but you, you're right and, and I and I I hope that we, we, we do that as well as we can at, at DX and in Derbyshire as much as possible. Yeah. It's been really interesting to learn that DaVinci model. But if we if we kind of touch on your own kind of coaching philosophy, obviously, or your coaching career, coaching is always a very selfless job. You're never the one overly in the spotlight for the success of your swimmers. So for yourself as a coach, how would you measure success on your career? Deep question that one. It is. It is. <laughs> um, I, gosh, I, I I think I had a, I've had a few conversations with a really good coaching buddy of mine, um, Mike Glossop. He was at Bassett Law. I don't know if you come across Mike. Um, he was a really bright guy, and 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 we we talk about things like this. We get in some deep conversations, mm. but I think it comes down to is it a word that's banded around quite a bit called legacy. Like I, I, but it is my, maybe not what you think of. So mine is not like, I don't want to plaque on the pool or anything like that. Like I, for me, if I finish and um, 
and you've managed to create a legacy with as many people as you can. That's that's mm. the most important. If you say he helped me do this or he helped me be a better person, I'm doing the career I want because of the values installed and the, the good behaviors installed by this guy, then I, I, th- I think I've, I've, I've done a good thing. Um, it, it's not necessarily, you know, if Jacob goes on and, and wins an Olympic medal down the line or, you know, Mia goes on and, and represents her country at a senior level, that's fantastic, but that's only going to be a small part of their life. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, for me, have, have they become the best people they can because of the time we had working together and that played a part then for me, that's a success and I've done a decent job. What would you say is the most important thing you've learned over your coaching career from the 14 years at Nova and the, the six, seven years at DX? Uh, kind of a piece of advice to pass on to you, like a young yeah. coach who's just starting out their career. Uh, never, never be afraid to ask a question. Like, even if you think it's stupid, like just ask it. Um, mm. Most... Most most coaches, no matter how long they've been in the game, want to share. I've found that. That's been quite good. Um, so I'll always ask questions. Um, there's no golden rule. I nicked that off. Uh, what's his name? You, you, I guess you guys listen to the performance podcast with mm. Jake on prison that. I was yeah, off yeah. the Timo Wolf one. Like he said, like there's no golden rule to high performance and there isn't just just be really open and honest with your athletes the people you work with uh, and don't be afraid to ask questions and if you don't know something say you don't know it but you'll do what you can to find out I think that's a good, mm. good way to look at it um you, you're always going to work more hours than you think that's just, <laughs> behind the scenes it's always. life isn't yeah. it <laughs> but yeah like if you're going to be successful you got to do more that's just yeah. part of it and I would say um, the attitude of your program and your swimmers and the people within it um, reflect your leadership. So, you know, if you're working hard, if you're seen to be going out your way and 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 set, living by the by the values that you hold, then I don't think you'll go far wrong. Mm, brilliant. If you were to go back over your career and change one, maybe two things, would there be anything that you would change? Oh, gosh. Uh, Again, it kind of comes under the advice thing for new coaches coming yeah, up, I suppose. Um, I don't think there's anything I'd change, like, because I, I wouldn't be where I am if I had done it. Um, <laughs> That's true, yeah, yeah. So, I, I like, my, my career is, I had a, I, I'd got my dream job you know, when I was at Nova and it was my boyhood program and I had a great apprenticeship under Bill, like to work every day with someone like that, you you do learn a lot and it opened a lot of doors. Now I had to press those opportunities. I was like, have you got so-and-so's number? Have you Mm. got their email? And I I used him as a real, and I still use him as a resource. He's a good friend. So I changed, gosh, I, I think... It's funny, like as a young coach, I, you want everything to be perfect. And, and actually, I think learning this lesson probably over the last 10 years is, is that actually it's the imperfections that make it great. Because mm. you, 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 as a coach, you're constantly looking for solutions. And that, I think that's when you're best, when you're trying to be creative and find find little successes in those solutions. Don't get frustrated by things when they don't work. Just keep going and keep going. And you'd encourage your athlete, your swimmers to do that. So why shouldn't you be doing that as a coach? Definitely. Wise words. Yeah. So I think that's just about kind of rounds up this week's episode of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast. I've really enjoyed learning about the structure of the Ventio as a club and the way that that setup works, especially for swimmers who are potentially going to be involved in it or for parents looking from the outside inwards it's it's kind of good to see kind of the honest attitude behind it i think that's how i'd put it rather Mm -hmm. than it it trying to hoard these these really good swimmers all it's trying to do is push on swimming for that region as a whole that's the aim that's the aim 
I feel like your philosophy is is correct. It's all about group cohesion, morale, keeping everyone together. Because and and swimming, like you say, is a short term goal, if you like. But actually, the life lessons you learn from it are uh, it just expands further into the working world and personal life as well. I think it's great what you do. I tell you yeah. what, I'd love to speak to some of your kind of former alum of Nova or Da Vincio. So say the ones who are now at the elite training programs and understand how it set them up for that stage of their career, because usually that transition from youth swimmer to elite open swimmer is quite tough. It's quite hard to make that jumps. And there's several countries around the world that really struggle to make that transition. So I'd, I'd wonder if any of your alum have found that the DaVentia model has really set them up for the professional side of the sport. Well, I, I think if you look at people like, I mean, this was before my time, they they moved on. And Abby and Sarah were the last ones um, mm. just just before I came in, actually. Um, and and I, I think Abby would be really interesting to talk to because her transition has been probably what you'd say is typical, although she, it's been quite challenging. So she mm. sort of broken into teams, gone away on meets, probably in her own head, um, didn't quite hit her performances that she'd have wanted. And then, but then we've seen in, in, in the last 12 months, her really come, come to the fore with the mm. ISL. And, and then obviously in the long course performances, uh, she, she's hit since, since new year. Mm. Um, but I think that's typical. It takes five or six years to make that transition from a world-class junior and, and Abby won European juniors 400 IM. Mm. So she's mm-hmm. been classed in that that bracket to become someone who, who who is at the top end of senior swimming at an international level. It takes five or six years, and I think all the research the British swimming have done um, in the last few years shows that with yeah. their medal winners at junior level, it, it it takes on average five or six years, and 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 that time is tricky. It's really challenging because you're so used to success relative success um, and you're almost starting again you're trying to break in you're trying to break into teams you're trying to then break into international finals and mm. potentially challenge for medals and you know you, you don't quite often the guys who are doing well at a top end junior level aren't there at 11 12 but they are there when they get to 17 18 so why shouldn't mm. it be the same at a senior level when you're breaking in it into the senior ranks at 18 why isn't it? Why don't we say, you know, you've got five or six years rather than it be, you know, a two to three year gig. It's going to be double that really. Yeah. We, mm. I think we spoke to Abby Wood during ISL and she was kind of bouncing that she had had that breakout. She had kind of the work had been done and she found a meet that really worked for her. Kind of that quick fire nature got her out of her own head. Yeah. And it, yeah. it was so good for her. Yeah, and I remember, I mean, obviously I didn't coach at the time, but I remember Abby when she was with Andy Manley and, and Kim Hill, who's one mm. of a big part of her uh, age group development. Um, she was a back-to-back swimmer. She she was British junior yeah. record holder on 200 breaststroke. She was great, 400 IM. She could do 800, for, she could do any, and she used to see her at me. She'd be literally out of one, you know, mm. barely have time to get in a swim down into the next race. And, um so the ISL is literally the senior version of that, isn't it? You literally yeah. add one into another. There's not a lot of time to overthink it. And, I, and I'm so happy for Abby. She's such a nice lady and, and works her absolute backside off. Like, mm. and, and she's persevered through some times that were really tough for her in terms of breaking into those senior ranks. So I couldn't be happier for Abs. She's, she's such a, such a great person. And, and a fierce, fierce trainer and competitor, definitely. Yeah, Scott was thinking that she's actually got a good chance of getting on the podium come Tokyo for the 200 IM. Well, oh, and we'll 200 see. breaststroke now. <laughs> yeah, possibly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She's she's uh, she's in that mix, I would say. And I think you know, if she, if she can just keep keep doing what she's doing, like she's she's like any swimmer when she's in a happy place and she's working mm. well, she swims mm. fast and. Um, yeah, like uh, she's been great. As I say, I've seen her most days at the centre working with Dave mm-hmm. Hemmings, who's, who's, who's fantastic yeah, coach. Amazing Dave. job. Yeah, mm-hmm. he is. And, 
you know, I, I've known Dave for, gosh, well over 10 years. I remember taking some of his kids to European juniors uh, back in the day and, and, and he's always been really open with sharing and we, we message all the time, literally, what do you think's this set? What do you think's that set? And um, some of the stuff we've, that Abby's been doing in training is phenomenal. Um, but credit to Dave, like he, he, he's got a really, really good relationship and you can see that on deck with those mm. pair in particular. They've got a really good understanding and that's just been developed over the last, takes time to build a relationship and, and they've, they've come through the, the tough times and that has built great trust and uh, strength in their partnership. So uh, I, I really hope she, she has an opportunity and, and she grabs it in the summer. Definitely. Mm. Well, Jamie, it's been amazing speaking to you. Thank you so much for giving up your time to come onto the podcast. Thanks, if you don't mind, me. we usually finish with some quick fire questions. We usually do this for the elite swimmers, but we have a coach's version as well that we gave oh, okay. to Russ Barber. Okay. So if you're happy to answer them, <laughs> yeah, I will no send them your way. Okay, I'll, be so- I'll be interested. In t- uh, I haven't seen Russ's, so I'll, I'll go back and watch that. He's got some fun. We, we asked him some really deep questions for that podcast. We put him under pressure for most of it. That was mainly uh, Scott. Scott was on fire with those questions, but yeah, uh, <laughs> it was a good one. It was a good one. Russ is someone as well. Like he's such a resource and, you know, a big name in British swimming. Mm. And I think um, he's always been really supportive of me since I first got into coaching. Um, had a lot of time with Russ personally as well. And I, I you know, he's uh, such a knowledge source yeah. for the mm. sport. No, it's good. Mm. Okay, so first question, what is your favourite stroke to coach? Oof. Uh, interesting. Uh, I'd say breaststroke. Like, that's, it's just so many, like, unique individual variants to the stroke, depending on the person, mm. I guess. There's some fundamentals, obviously. Uh, but yeah, I'd say breaststroke. Who's your swimming idol? Now it could be a coach or a swimmer. <laughs> Ooh, gosh. I'd say Becky Adlinson. Uh, and just just because I know her journey personally, and and she's still like I hold her up as a benchmark in terms of a swimmer, and, and because I know what she did in training and stuff. Yeah, I'd hold Becky up there. She's she's real hero of mine and i say i've known her since she was a little kid so yeah definitely she still very much is the face of british swimming right now actually she's yeah, still... yeah, I, I feel really fortunate to call her a friend and mm. um she's 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 so like down to earth and grounded at in, in first person with me like she's she's always been a big supporter um mm. as i say seeing her grow up and overcome some real challenges personally and and i you know I think, again, someone who, who has got so much knowledge and experience in the sport, I think we could probably use her a bit more, really. Mm. What's the hardest set you've ever given out? Given out? Whoa. Yeah. Uh, not one I've given out. One okay. I took was, again, to Becky. Um, she did 18 300s freestyle, short course in a pool that was really hot, actually. It was, temperature was up. Um, and I, it was one hold, one descend. The hold ones were off, let me get this right, uh, 3.45, and she'd hold probably 3.20 to 25s on those. And then descend one off four minutes, one to nine. Okay, and she descended short course to 3.02 Ooh. from a push. That's good. That's that was, bad. Uh, probably not the toughest, but the most that probably the most impressive thing I've seen in training mm. at like for like, like, and the way she, I just, it was a privilege to take her through that session. Um, I remember Bill talking to about, me about it in the morning. He's like, do you think she could do that? I was like, yeah, she could do it. It's just how fast she wanted to go at the end. And we were like, should we give her more rest? Should we not? Um, so that was pretty impressive. That was impressive. Hardest mm. set I've ever given. We've done the hundred hundreds and stuff like that. Like, yeah, a lot of the swimmers that we speak to, all of it is. I think one of them was like eight hundred IMs and stuff like that. That they all 
say is pretty hard as soon as the IMs get involved. Yeah, like mm. the, we've done stuff. We did stuff on a camp in 2019. We had a guy. I mean, he, he's a he's an Olympic trials qualifier and he's over 18, so he's a bit annoyed he can't get in. Um, mm. And he's t- really tough. Like he did uh, five one thousands, uh, one fly, one back. One is a four by two fifty IM, one brass, one free. That was pretty tough. Oh. But it, but uh, I said like we were all going to do five one thousands freestyle, and he asked to do it like that. So that's a thousand so, fly. That's not nice. Uh, <laughs> wow, he, he, what, he, what a weird he, thing to say. <laughs> he's, a tough, he's a tough guy. Like he's really tough. He he trains a lot with Mia, uh, but mm. he does it madly, and she does it freestyle. So. Um, yeah, I've seen some impressive sets like over the years. Like mm. I remember a guy called Adam Faulkner who went to two Olympics, two thousand and four. Mm. And I trained with it. We were good friends. I trained with him, and then when I started coaching, he was obviously still swimming. And um, he did twenty five fours or five, um, like I can't remember what it was. It was like hold he had to hold 20 descend the last five um, and he held like something ridiculous like 410 short and then the last five he descended to 355 that's pretty yeah, good it's good well, it's good, yeah, it's, it's good sets yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> no like, i could talk sets all day like I just I mean, I, 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 <laughs> we'll set up a later podcast and just do <laughs> sets for an hour <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, I've seen some impressive stuff. Like I remember being at the holding camp in uh, Edinburgh, pre-London, seeing Michael James like run through some stuff, and Dave McNaughty was like taking him and stuff. And I remember Michael was pushing, like pushing back to back thirty points for breaststroke long course. Bloody not bad. How many like, times through? Jeez. Like Let's he was going. doing. I remember rightly, he was doing like. It, it was, I'm sure it was like 450s and these were off a minute, like they weren't off big rest and then a hundred easy. And I saw it, he did like three rounds and everyone was a 30 point. It's just classic broken 200s really, isn't it? But he was just like, <laughs> and he goes, yeah. he goes, he goes 207, he gets beaten mm. by the guy that breaks the world rack and you think, actually, yeah. I can understand why he does that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Impressive. Like, mm. But yeah, anyway, your quick fire rounds just gone out the window. <laughs> oh, no, no, not a problem. I'm amazed by some of these sessions. Uh, <laughs> um, a final one. If you were to go on a road trip and you had three people in the car, they can be friends, family, or celebrities, who would you have in that car with you? Always a tough one. Mm. I'm hoping my wife doesn't watch this podcast. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, gosh. Three people. Um, Martin Luther King. Okay. One. Um, Muhammad Ali. You're allowed, to, you're allowed to do people that aren't here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just What's, anyone, basically. Yeah. Yep, anyone. Yeah, yeah. Oh, gosh. It's inspirational car so far. It yeah, is so far. You need someone who's got a good musicality, so I'd probably go Paul McCartney, someone like that. Nice. So that's a high, high profile car that one yeah. I, think, I think you'd have really good playlist and um so i think all of them had had great stories so mm. one from a um a political so a civil rights angle one for them that and the sporting angle and then i, I think a musician's always good and if i could squeeze uh, like a a fourth one in i'd probably go like someone from Hollywood, I guess, but I'd have to think about that one. Maybe someone <laughs> like uh, someone like a Will Smith. He's quite good. I follow oh, him. Okay, yeah. he's charismatic, yeah. isn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Definitely. Well, Jamie, it has been fantastic speaking to you. I've learned a lot. Dan, have you learned a lot? Oh, oh God, absolutely. I'm still in half shock of the sets we've just heard. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. Honestly, it's been great. Right. It has. It's, it's, you see some of these guys like up close. And they are extremely impressive, like mm. the higher level. Um, and and I've, I've been, re- you know, fortunate that I swam in a great program under Bill and then got the opportunity to coach there from such a young age and, and, and made those connections with coaches and swimmers. And um, 
but I get just as excited taking our youngest group and seeing a kid be able to do something for the first time or, um, mm. you know, teaching them something over a number of weeks and, and them hitting it and, you know, the, the excitement you can see in their face and, um, and building relationship as well with the swimmer and the family. And like, you just get just as big a buzz because it is about relationships. We're in a people business, aren't we? So yeah, exactly. Definitely. Yeah. Well, Jamie, thank you so much for coming on. Good luck to your swimmers for the rest of the season. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll stay in touch and hopefully speak to you again soon. It's been great having you. Oh, thank you for having me. It's been a, been a real pleasure. Um, as hey, if you want me to come back again in the future, more than happy to do a whole thing on training sets. Definitely. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Much terrifying. <laughs> 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 yeah. thank, thank you for your time, lads. And uh, well, thank all, you. all the best with the podcast. Yeah. Cheers, Jamie. Yeah. That just about rounds up this week's episode of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast. Thank you, everyone, for listening. If you haven't subscribed to us already, please do so on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or Spotify, or any other podcast provider that you use. I've been Scott, he's been Dan, and we will see you in seven days. And we'll catch you on the next one. You've been listening to the Propulsion Swimming Podcast with Scott and Dan. We want to thank you for joining us and invite you to subscribe to the show as well as checking out the Propulsion Swimming YouTube channel for weekly tutorials and videos to get your swimming fix. We will be back next week. Until then, we'll catch you on the next one.